Welcome to the commentary booth where we watch and you guessed it, commentate on the week that was in movies and TV. I'm your host and play-by-play -play commentator Jamie Apps and each week I'm joined by a rotating cast of colour commentators to help you find your next viewing treat. This week I'm joined by a freelance social commentator who lists their favourite movie as American Psycho and favourite TV show as Yellowstone. Welcome to the show, Blake Robinson. Jamie Apps. Thank you for having me. So we we're keeping American Psycho after this movie, or are we changing? <laughs> we changing best movie. Look, can I live my life guilt free in my own skin, changing my favorite movie from American Psycho to Barbie, or not? Is that acceptable? That's but no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> Barbie's a very good movie. We've been through this. It's enjoyable, very entertaining, but you know what? It's missing. Explosions. Patrick Bateman. Okay. Random. Okay. Um, explosions. <laughs> well, we'll get to explosions, won't we? Yes. Whether lackluster or not. Eh. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's been a big, it's been a big week, couple of weeks, hasn't it? It's for us. Very big movie time. And um, but like I said, you may as well get high on the supply that is available because it's about to be not as abundant very quickly, I think. There's already there's already things drying up. Ne I've just seen uh, the second June movie is pushed back to like June next year already. Oh, is it? Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> That's yeah. a hot take for you. I think a bunch of things are going to start getting... Yeah, it's, it's going to start drying up. So Especially, we may very well see Barbenheimer in the cinemas for six months. Forget your month to six week runs. This could be a six month run. <laughs> yeah, especially like things that have already, like they're already in the can ready to release. I think studios yeah. might start bumping them because they want to have that pre-release pre promo run with the stars exactly. on the, the red carpet and doing all the interviews and stuff rather than just sending... The only person we can send is the director. Yeah. Um, look, it's there's it's no secret that this Barbie promo tour has been one of the greatest of all time. Do you think that had much to do with these box office numbers we're seeing, or like, did people want to see this film anyway? Obviously, it's had some sort of an impact, but it's, is that much of a significant impact? I think the biggest thing for this film is going to be word of mouth. Yeah, I think just like the the word of mouth and like the cachet of Barbie really helps. It's just got a like, whole following. It especially like women, like it captures women of all ages and then that they drag along their, their friends or they drag along their partners, so mm. you're kinda of getting two people every single time rather than just yep. one person wants to go. Like, it's, like we discussed, like this is going to be a hit for the uh, the 50, 60 year old women too. Because it's yeah, like very entertaining everyone. for an adult. Whereas today's topic of discussion, The Great Oppenheimer, I feel as though people who want to see it, they want to see it anyway. And me telling my mate that it's good isn't breaking news. And like, it's me saying it's good isn't going to convince someone else to go see it. I don't think, like, if you want to see it, you want to see it. Like, I don't think anyone's on the fence about seeing it. And I think, like, the box office numbers in comparison to Barbie reflect that. Like, this hasn't got any new groundbreaking fans that want to go all of a sudden see it because someone said it was good. Like, we all know it's good. <laughs> yeah, it's a Christopher Nolan movie. Like, it's going to be high-quality, stacked and cast. Like, like, you can easily convince someone to go watch a fun movie with some stars in it that goes for two hours, but you're not going to convince someone that has nothing to do to go watch a three hour pretty like dark movie <laughs> it, pretty dark it's one of the heaviest movies i've seen that's not technically horror Ooh. um heavy in what way are you saying jamie is oppenheimer heavy as in i think my entire preview screening for this movie walked out of the cinema in silence um yeah, it wasn't one of those ones where you walk out and you instantly start having a discussing chat. <laughs> it's fun scenes. Like it was a it was a moment to yourself process at walk out. 
wasn't it? Yep. That movie finished like, and I just oh. got up, silently walked out yeah, yeah. and drove home so pretty much in silence, just being like, <laughs> wow. Didn't even talk to yourself. That's how much you had. <laughs> just sitting there just. Uh, just yeah, I was the same. There was a lot to unpack. And I think like the first thing I spoke to my movie comrades who I went with was, I can't even imagine what it would have been like living back in those times. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like it was just straight reflection of history and what unfolded as opposed to trying to dissect the movie. Yep. It was a heavy one. Um, speaking of heavy, uh, do you, is this movie banned in Japan by any chance? I don't think so. They did a very good job of um, respecting what happened and respecting the victims, didn't they? Yeah, I have seen like some this, criticism this wasn't, of... This wasn't a movie about the bombing. No, it was a movie it's about, about the, the creation, bomb. the science behind the bomb, the bomb yeah. and the fallout from it. Uh, so we'll make that clear. This isn't a, like, a sensitive movie. In saying that, I, what would I, I'm not directly affected by it, so I can't really officially say it's not sensitive, but they did a good job of keeping it respectful, I believe, yeah. by also not even showing spoiler if you want action and gore, there is no actual footage of Japan or any sort of bombing of that like in this movie. They did a very good job of keeping that sort of under wraps. Yeah, and that's that's the criticism I've heard. This is, is a nice touch. A movie about the nuclear bomb and <clears throat> there's not a single Asian person in the movie. Is that what they're saying? I saw a bunch of people complaining about that. All right, if they put Japanese people in this movie, there would be riots, I believe saying that's we can't do that yes please respect the victims you can't win jamie we know that and we continue to learn that and that's just life yep 2023 welcome Alrighty. so yeah this week we're going back in time to discover the story of the father of the atomic bomb j robert oppenheimer in christopher nolan's new epic oppenheimer before we dive into the, the film though uh, with the strike going on, Pario Magazine stands in solidarity and support of the WGA and SAG-AFTRA in their fight for better working conditions. Our publication has always been focused on the creative brilliance of these individuals rather than on the, on the business of film and TV. As such, we will continue to highlight their creative talents during this time so that their contribution to our entertainment is not overlooked. Speaking of that, uh, not to burn bridges, but Netflix mm. aren't exactly <laughs> playing along, are they? <laughs> no. Let's hire an AI guy paying, what, $900 million or something? $300 million or something? It's basically Stupid. like Woolies putting in like eight self-service checkouts and taking jobs off young teenagers. Mm-hmm. That's There's the analogy. Yep. <laughs> That's what Netflix are doing. They're putting in self-service. Yep. Counters. Yeah, they want to hire a AI specialist to basically run the AI division and with the money they want to pay that person, they could pay like 30-something actors. No, it's scary and it is the future and one day it's just going to be like sort of one person in charge of all these robots. Mm-hmm. And the most ridiculous thing is like a small studio like A24 who is – one of my favorite film production companies. Yep. We all love A24. They're, they're actually allowed to continue filming because they have agreed to every condition that the Writers Guild and SAG-AFTRA have requested. Huge. So they've been given an exemption to continue producing movies, which if a small studio like that can meet all of these requirements, why can a Disney or a Universal or an Amazon and a Netflix meet the same requirements. Interesting. Um, well, I'm not mad about that because just pump out the A24 content. Yeah, please. I'll take A24 movies get. all year. That's fine for maybe. If that's all we're going to get <laughs> for the next 12 months. Because like um, even, anyway. even with Oppenheimer, if you look at the uh, cost of this, the budget was $100 million for this movie. Oi. Which is lower than the budget for Marvel's uh, Secret Invasion TV series and 
essentially half of the cost of Thor Love and Thunder. And this movie is head and shoulders miles above both of those movies. I was shocked to see that this had a hundred million dollar budget and Barbie had a hundred and fifty million dollar budget. Can you believe that? Yeah, that's pretty crazy considering as you look at the uh cast list for uh, this movie alone. Yeah. Oh my god. All right, the first thing I thought of, uh <laughs> and this is like only early doors when I started watching, I was like, this is the NBA All Star game for movie cast. Mm-hmm. And just when you think you had seen every single person you've ever seen in a movie, like right up until like the dying minutes of the movie, there's like someone else pops up. Um, quick off, I've, I took as many notes as I could of like people, cameos, a um, couple that stood out to you, unexpected maybe. Uh, Rami Malek. Oh, trusty list. Uh, Rami Malek is um, a good one. I, yes. Of Freddie Mercury fame. I had no idea he was in this. There was oohs and ahs and murmurs in the cinema when he popped up on screen. Mm-hmm. Um, another one that I heard his voice and knew who it was instantly, Casey Affleck. Yep. As soon as he started talking, he was like an army general. As soon as he started talking, I was like, oh, Casey Affleck. Uh, ben Safdie, good to see him. Very prominent role too. Mm-hmm. The great Ben Safdie of Safdie Brothers fame. Good time. Um, uncut Gems. A couple of the greats there. Um, the president, President Truman. Yep, Gary Oldman. Did you get that one? Gary Oldman. Gary Oldman. Um, how about Josh Peck? He was he played a small but pivotal role, the one who pushed the button of the atomic bomb from yep. uh, Drake, Drake and Josh on Nickelodeon. Yep. Um, there's a couple of stars from Halloween franchise in this. Dylan Arnold and Jefferson Hall. Mm-hmm. Very recognisable. Um, and there was Alex Wolf. Speak of A24, Alex Wolf from Hereditary. Yep. Um, and the great Jason Clark, Australian. He's doing. He's in everything at the moment, and I love it. I see he's in a movie that's premiering in Venice next month too. Um, he's a very good actor, but I feel like the roles he always plays are like irritating and like. Just they're like villain roles, and he plays a good like villain that you want to hate. Because oh. he plays the uh, in Oppenheimer. Um, Roger Rob. What would you? Sorry. Roger Rob the. Is that the like? Yeah. In, what the guy in the interrogation Almost, thing? Yeah, interrogator. I was going to call him, yeah. but for a second. Um, and who else? Matthew Modine. I recognize him from Stranger Things. He's like the cop. Mm-hmm. Doctor from Stranger Things is in Full Metal Jacket, Dark Knight Rises. Like I said, there's lots of uh, Christopher Nolan alumni in this, as he likes to do yep. in his movies. And uh, Josh Hartnett was another great addition as well. He was fantastic as Ernest Lawrence, the physicist. Oh, true, true. Um, but I think there's one standout, clear standout performance. Um, and it could, it's, it's, there's going to be, there's got to be Oscar buzz. And it wasn't Cillian Murphy as a lead as Oppenheimer. I believe it was Robert Downey Jr. Oh. In a Best Supporting Actor role. If he doesn't get Best this Supporting was, Actor, I don't know who does. I'm not here, Jamie Apps, if Robert Downey Jr. doesn't get Best Supporting Actor nominations for this film. He was impeccable in this. Oh, fantastic. Career-defining. And, like, almost From unrecognizable to the makeup. Doing Tropical Thunder <laughs> to this, yeah. Um, yeah, almost recognize, unrecognizable. Because all his all his uh, on screen moments in black and white too. Yep. Yeah, and he's fantastic. In like typical Nolan fashion, like likes to jump around across timelines. Yep. And um, which can be a bit hard to follow. I think Emily Blunt is another one who will be right up there for best supporting actor. Hundred percent. I said that as well. Her scene where she gets interrogated. Her little oh, interview. Oh, so good. W- I'm going to say it's the, my favorite scene in the movie. It's very powerful, and she just goes hell for leather. Yeah, she shreds that bloke. That is shreds. One of the all-time scenes. One of the all-time Christopher Nolan scenes, I'm going to go out and say. Brilliant. Emily Blunt, brilliant. Um, take nothing away from Cillian Murphy in this. Clearly brilliant. Um, for a lead in a three-hour movie, he still had a lot of screen time, a lot of lines, 
Um, just brilliant, just brilliant, flawless. Couldn't fault it. Even the moments know, where he think, doesn't say anything, like he says he's saying so, so much. much. In his face. Oh, says so much. But and, and like, like I said, that's as good as as great as Cillian Murphy was as Oppenheimer. I that's just it speaks volumes about Robert Downey Jr. and Emily Blunt mm-hmm. and Florence um, Pugh. She has some bro, some scenes. I was unclear of. Oh, there's some scenes. Florence Pugh fans, there are scenes that will impress and make you happy. Unless you see this in Korea. And, yeah, then, 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 but you still get to see her lovely face, but they've that's add, that all you'll see. Added a black dress to her for no reason, which yes, makes no yeah. sense. Like, no, we in the context of that scene, like, she gets up it's and puts a random it's black pointless. dress on. Like, it's they couldn't CG like a, a dressing gown or something where it would make a bit more sense. So Florence is one of the cast members we knew were in this. And what did you think of her role? I was, I was unclear of her character going into this movie, but she doesn't, she's not really in the movie much. But when she's in it, she's in it. Or it's in her, you could say. Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, yeah, I think she plays a really critical role in terms of the development of like Oppenheimer Story as a line. person. Yeah, yeah. Because he hundred percent. She's a good call. kind of is she's <clears> the, <throat> the thing that he falls back on when he's having problems and it opens up his mind to like mental health and struggles that other people have because he's sort of he is a very divisive character where he's kind of obsessed and cocky, but then he realizes that and he's sort of There's people out there worse off than him. Yeah, and he doesn't like and doing it he doesn't do him. well with people, like the social interactions. And she's like the one person that like grounds he him and he, he has him. that. Um, and when she was lost, that really brought him back down to earth. And I think <laughs> you could say that motivated him and re-sparked his creative energy. Mm-hmm. And she, her like, um, what would you call it? Her energy, her soul sort of motivated him for his future endeavours and essentially maybe what got the atomic bomb off the ground yep. or on the ground, you could say. Mm. So, yeah, as much as she isn't on screen, other than early in the movie, she has, like she definitely is there in spirit for the remainder of the movie and like motivates so Oppenheimer. Yep. Um, that's Florence, another main cast member, which we knew, uh, Matt Damon, one of the greats. Mm-hmm. Great little role. Yeah, it's Great. another All very right. good performance. Very good. Um, so he plays like the army general that sort of pretty much called the shots on behalf of the military, yeah, and the government. Yep. He was like the in-between guy, the middleman for Oppenheimer and the president, essentially. Yeah, he's like the he, he's the, the military the head of reported to. the Manhattan Project. Yep. Uh, yeah, brilliant. I th- yeah, I thought there were a lot of like almost career-defining roles in this, like, like all the, I oh know, I know. When I say career defined, I know all these actors have established their own because they're greats, they're the goats. But really good roles, like really, really solid performances. I think for nearly everybody in this movie, it is their best performance ever. Bro, I Robert Downey Jr. This is incredible. I, I was speechless at how good he was. Yeah, coming off um, Iron Man, like, and like I said, he's great. In that, Thunder. Like, this is this is a whole nother level of <laughs> There was one particular scene, you know how some actors just have their thing or like recognizable thing? When Robert Downey Jr. runs or like jogs, he does it a lot in Sherlock Holmes. He does this little like I don't know, it's recognizable. Like <laughs> if you just saw like a three second clip of an actor like running from behind, you're like, that's Robert Downey Jr. He does it when he's like running out of like that some building. I'm like, oh my god, it's so funny. It's almost like comical. Like I've seen the Sherlock Holmes movies so many times. They're great. They're witty as, and I was like, oh my god, that's funny. <laughs> like in all the like the seriousness of this movie and his character in this, he does a little funny little Sherlock Holmes run. It's like, oh, let's let's not have him run. <laughs> uh, yes, that was that. And like, even like for Christopher Nolan. For me, this is his best output of that he's ever done. Like, 
it does such a good job of being this really emotional story that has like different layers to it. You've got like the biopic as the core, but then you've got like the spy espionage and then the, the backstabbing and the chess game. But then you have this like romance story woven throughout it of like a love triangle. And then there's a little bit of horror towards the end as well. Like there's so many genres at play, but he does a great job of making them all work and feel like they all belong alongside each other. Uh, Yeah, it all worked. Cause I know, I know what you're saying by a lot of movies will try put like a little love story, romance tale in to like break things up. And cause people, people love a love story, like romance in a movie. Um, and a lot of I know a lot of writers will try to put that sort of stuff in to keep people's attention, but at work this time, eh? Because a lot of time it doesn't work. You can tell they've just put it in. Yep. Yeah, like this one felt like it was. It made sense for it to be in there and didn't feel shoehorned at all. Because yeah. I think because it's not told in like a traditional sense, like it's kind of just oh, we're introduced to Gene Tatlock and then we're introduced to Kitty and we kind of just move along like yes they're together now we don't have that whole like back and forth like we're we're trying to woo the girl and get her on our side like they're just here's the person Mm. they have a quick conversation and that's enough and you're like okay i feel the chemistry between them straight away it wasn't trying to make you take sides or so like that's like you see like a lot of movies will do Mm -hmm. they want you to like choose, choose your own journey well, you can't really choose your own journey in a movie like this because it's, it's like not made up. <laughs> yeah. Choose your own adventure, so to speak. Back on like touching on the, he did, like you said, he touched on bits of horror in this. Um, some of those scenes, more notably, was when Cillian Oppenheimer um, sort of, they started to bring in how he had blood on his hands and he had those thoughts that, hang on, I've killed all these people. Yep. And some notable scenes when he was giving that speech. Oh, that's um, a phenomenal on stage. Scene. Yeah, well, this is the second of two scenes which I thought Nolan absolutely nailed where he made everything silent and the sound was delayed. Mm-hmm. Um, the second of those was the atomic bomb test itself yep. where there was no sound for a couple of minutes. It was just all silence, all deafening noise, and it was just all visual. Then all of a sudden, the sound comes, which is absolutely brilliant, by the way. And then that was the same again when Cillian was giving his speech in front of his comrades, and it was just all silence, just stuck in his own head. He was just watching all these people cheer and celebrate while he's stuck in this moment of guilt and I've got blood on my hands. What have I actually signed up for? What have I done? Then he walks off stage and puts his foot in like a charred body, mm-hmm. which is a very confronting scene. Yeah. Yeah. That whole scene, like they echo that visually as well, where they sort of blur everything around him. And Cillian is the only person in focus for that yeah. majority of that scene. And then he sort of starts to see people in the crowd, like their faces are like melting <laughs> off and, he steps on the charred body and it's like he's really sort of having visions and feeling the fallout of his creation. And it's like, oh, Jesus, yeah, um, heavy. And you could say that was, the, that was the only sort of scene, although the only moments in the film that touched on what actually happened in Japan. That was the closest we got yeah. to what this bomb actually did. Um, so yeah, if you're watching this film and want action and you want bombings and you want war, anarchy, then you're not going to see it. Yeah. It's, um, it's spoiler alert, it, but this it is, is a, a war film, but it's not a war film. One of the first things I said when I walked out is like, is this a top 10 war movie ever? Is it in a conversation? Yeah, I guess... Top 10 World War Two movie ever, maybe? Yeah, definitely a World War Two movie. Um, because we all know the best war movie of all time is Forrest Gump, and well, I won't hear otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> That's just facts, I'm sorry. Um, what else What else did you like? What else? 
Um, any other pivotal scenes? Um, it's, it's no secret that I like to shed a tear when watching literally anything. Uh, tears were shed in this. When uh, Cillian tells Emily to bring the sheets in after a successful uh, <laughs> test bombing. Yep. Uh, very emotional scene. Yeah, their, their little code for if it went well or failed. If it went well. So what did, did you... I don't know if I'm thinking or reading too much into this. Were the sheets up to protect the house from the blast? I don't think the so. shot from the blast? I don't think so. Or to cover, like, the windows? Or was that just the... I think it was... Just overthinking I think it? it was just a their little code thing, like, leave them out and I'll tell you to bring them in if everything goes well. If it fails, then I'll tell you to leave them out. And then, yep. and then they then play that later when he's going through his um, trial hearing thing and he calls her and says to leave them out. Cause yeah, that was great. That was a well, he I lost. like how they did that again. Um, you mentioned this bef- to me beforehand. For some reason, you seen it before me. Not sure how that happened. <laughs> Is what it is. Um, you said it didn't feel like three hours, and I was the same, bro. Yeah, does not feel. I like I didn't look at my time the whole time I was watching this, and I was sort of putting off needing to go to the toilet. And I was like, all right, I'm going to bite the bullet. I'm just going to run to the toilet. When I went walked to the toilet, it was like 20 minutes to go in the film. I looked at my phone. I was like, there was 20 minutes to go. I was like, what? <laughs> I could have just made the whole made it. I was like, what do you mean there's 20 minutes to go? Yeah. I was like, I, I thought at least another hour and a half with this film. Nope. So <laughs> I lasted like two hours and 40 minutes out going to the toilet. And like, yeah, I was like, oh my God, I could have waited 20 minutes. Yep. Yeah, it, it flies. Uh, For, didn't feel like it. Like it's slow, but it doesn't feel slow. Like you don't feel like but in, um, it's chugging. Like it just tells the story in such a compelling way that the time flies by even though the story is progressing quite slowly. And there is a lot of dialogue and a lot of parts you really have to follow. Like a lot of these hearings you really have to listen to and a lot of back and forth you have to like, and like, like I said, the timeline jumps around, you have to pay attention. Mm-hmm. I'm glad like this is a, you've got to see this in the cinema for like oh. one of the main reasons is this, like, cause yeah. everyone's guilty of it. I don't care. If you're watching a movie at home, you've got your phone in your hand and you're scrolling every now and then, you're replying to messages and you put your head down for 45 seconds, you miss so much of a film. Mm-hmm. And Nolan films are synonymous for that. Like Tenant, you can't just, Inception, you can't just stop watching for like a minute. Yep. Because then you like look back up, you're like, oh shit, what did I miss? Like, oh, where the hell am I? So yeah, this is one that um, yeah, you've got to see in the cinema, not only because it's a big screen epic, but yeah, you know, like you can't just willy nilly happen to have a scroll on your phone and you just miss too much. Even like on that epic front, like you need to see it in a cinema for the visual, like the grand size of everything yeah. in this movie, because the entire film was filmed in IMAX, which is very rare. Usually when they do that, they pick and choose which scenes to film in IMAX. Oh, yeah, I think. Um, I may have stuffed this number up, but I'm fairly sure I'm right. The IMAX film reel is like 17 kilometers long. 11 miles. So, yeah. So, yeah, 17 kilometers. Yeah. 11 um, miles and weighs 600 pounds. Yeah, I think they, they said there's only like 30 of them that exist in yeah. the world. And like... I, Pretty hectic. I've, I saw a photo in like one of the cinemas in the US that has the IMAX reel. And they had yeah. to like build extra tables and stuff for it to sit on as it like unfurls to go through the machines. Like geez. it would be, it would be sick to watch. Um, but like, like I was saying with the, the epicness, like you have that visual scale, but the soundscape as well, like just that opening, you feel everything. Like it's not just that's what, I'm that's hearing what it all. Like does, man. you feel it in your chest. It's like, oh, okay, we're in for it now. But the one thing this was a bit different to other recent Nolan films is there wasn't an epic opening scene. Like, Tenant, absolutely powerful opening action-packed scene. Dark Knight Rises with Bane when they're crashing that plane. Absolutely mm-hmm. one of the, probably the most epic opening scene of a movie ever. This doesn't have it. This is, like, very sort of drip-fed, but like you said, it's powerful in other ways. On reflection, it's a very powerful scene. 
Oh, upon reflection in the grand scheme. Because, things, like, yeah. you, um, you see all the, like, raindrops hitting the water and, like, the, the ripples. Yep, yep, And it's, yep, like... Yep. Makes a lot of sense It then now. ties back to the end of the, the chain reaction destroying the world because you see all the ripples, How? like, overflap. Look, overlapping. if he doesn't have, like, a blockbuster massive opening scene, that right of closing scene, oh, my God. That's, that's my favourite scene of the entire movie. <laughs> right. And I think yeah, that's I the scene that really sat with that. me. Like, oh, they basically yeah, just heck. said mutually assured destruction is inevitable. Yeah. Um, I was skeptical at first, not skeptical, but just unsure of Einstein's placement in that little universe. And I thought his little, cause he isn't in it much. There's probably like three or four scenes where he pops up in the film, gets mentioned a few times, but doesn't have a massive role without, I wasn't too adverse into what he, his role was in this whole atomic bomb. But now that I know, I like, I thought he was perfectly used in the film. Yep. Yeah, he's fantastic. I, I loved. Yeah, that. just like yeah, that was perfect. Um, which is cool. And I loved, I loved the really arty shots that uh, Nolan uses too to like depict physics, and it's it kind of reflects on Oppenheimer's thoughts on what physics is. Like, yeah. he doesn't look at, at physics as just like general science. Like, he looks at it as like art, and you're like you see that with like the the shots oh, yeah. of like the atoms and things like the electrons like all flowing, like just those shots, like they would make epic like screensavers, just those big scenes of like, (laughs) here's like these particles flying around each other. Yeah. Um, Oh, it is art to these guys. They're artists. Yeah. And the fact that there was no CGI used, I thought was incredible as well. Like Um, those, those particle uh, effect scenes, they're all with practical effects and the explosion. I've got one here for you. I've got one. Uh, the explosion. Yes, this movie there's no CGI. Would hire. Am I impressed by that? Not really. Is my life changed because there's no CGI? And it's not really. Um, the scene of the bombing, the test bombing, wasn't that epic. And they've, that's obviously because it was real, and they haven't used CGI. I and they can't use been, an actual atomic bomb, even though people are like, "Oh, did did he really use it?" Adam Bomb, like, no. I would have been more impressed if they had actually used CGI and made a real big deal out of the bombing scene, the test bombing scene, and made like an epic, epic explosion. Rather than the fact that there was, they flexed their muscles by not having CGI used. But maybe even have used actual footage of the real life. They could have used just the black flashing and, bits and pieces. The black and white footage of good. the origin of the yeah. actual test. Because that, that, that footage not, is nuts. not taking nothing away from the scene in the movie. It was sick. Like I said, it was great how they did the delayed sound, just made it deaf. I thought it was great. Uh, quick shout out to Ben Safdie for putting zinc all over his face. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that helped. <laughs> that was brilliant. I love um, how like naive they all were to the effects of radiation as well. Oh, yeah. Like they're oh, all just that sitting out in the open, not realizing that they're. Yeah, that, he says that guy's sitting in his car, and someone comes up to him and he's like, "Hey, you need to put glasses on." And he's like, "Oh no, the glass, uh, glass, glass stops will... the UV. Like glass doesn't stop the UV." Then he's like, yeah, "I've, stop I've been sunburnt in the car." Right. Then he's like, "What's going to stop the glass?" And um, and I thought, well, like the shock alone from that glass is just going to smash this windscreen and it's going to end up all in his face. I thought for sure that's going to happen, but spoiler alert, it didn't. Yeah, I think they were, they were probably far enough away that it was it had diminished a bit. But like you um, mentioned that, that silence, I love that because it, it, it echoes like what would happen in that moment because it's, yeah, an atom bomb like sucks everything in and then goes out. So you get that silence and then the shockwave hits and I thought that was great. Mm-hmm. I also yeah. loved that they used, um, like, you know, the, like, static noise that you get from a Geiger counter to measure radiation? Yes, yes, yes. I love yes, that yes, they yes. used that yeah, I did in, that, like, yeah. the music as, like, an element in music. I was like, that's yeah. phenomenal. Uh, yes, yeah, it, it was scored brilliantly. Shock no one. Um, anyway, what was I saying? Back on the blast, yeah, like, it would have been cool if they flashed in actual footage. That I don't think that would have made the movie tacky because you know how it can if they put in real-life footage into a movie. It's like, oh, it's a bit cheap. Oh, that takes away from everything. 
But yeah, I would have been more impressed by an absolutely epic, realistic looking atomic bomb blast than the fact that they did like a pretty lackluster one just to keep no CGI. Yeah, I was. I liked the blast. Well, I'm not going to tell Chris Van how to do his job. Yeah, but that's just what I would have done. <laughs> I was. I was looking, and they they used a, a combination of gasoline, propane, black powder, aluminium powder, and magnesium flares to recreate the test. And I thought it looked crazy. Like it looked pretty big. It's a, probably the biggest like real life explosion I've seen in a movie. Um. Oh yeah. I- I wouldn't even know what's real and what's not these days in movies. Yeah. Um, what did you think of the like scenes with the science and they were trying to determine if it was going to be safe to even test this thing? And they came up with the math says it's near zero. That's good enough. Oh, that was funny. Matt Damon's like Wait, near zero. Near what zero? do you mean? What do you mean near zero? So he's like, so he's like, there's a chance that this could end the world and he's like well there's about 99 percent it won't he's like and the one percent <laughs> yeah i think it was yeah, like 99.99 percent chance that it'll be fine but there's that like nearly zero chance that we uh set the atmosphere on fire well in hindsight it was a hundred percent chance it will end the world in one way or another eventually yes yes because now everybody has whether them that's and an it's... immediate whether that's an immediate effect of the explosion itself by instantly ending humanity, but in one way or another, this creation is has ended humanity. It's we're in the process. It's we're in the process now of being destroyed by it. Yeah, yeah. It just with, might not happen in our lifetime or our kids' lifetime, but it's going to happen. Yeah, with Russia going like that is going to kill <laughs> blow this place up. With Russia going a bit crazy at the moment, like yeah, it's literally like. And that was another recurring scene that Cillian, they made the viewer like reflect on and think about is this guy in front of the screen right now is creating something that will and can end humanity. Yeah. And like that's, and he knew that and he was aware of that. That's the only reason we he, don't he use that. nuclear weapons anymore because we all know that if one person uses them, now everybody's going to use them and that's the end. And there was another scene or moment in the film where, I forgot who it was um, approached Oppenheimer and said, hey, it's all well and good to create this thing and it's good that you're prepared for what's like happening, but are you prepared for what's going to happen after the bombing? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, this bomb's going to work, you'll end the war, la, la, la. But after that, you're going to unearth this weapon to the world and are you ready for the aftermath of that and what's to come in the future of this powerful weapon mm-hmm. and yeah not they kind of are but yeah it's just it's a matter of time until someone uses one whether it's a government based use of one or a terrorist based use of one like it's just very concerning that these exist these days um los Almos out in the desert um, no doubt going to be the most popular tourist attraction oh, in America in the next 12 months. Yeah, it's going to be nuts. Um, you, you won't get near the joint. <laughs> yeah. um, Good for them. I, for one, wouldn't mind paying a visit next time in America. It's never crossed my mind before. Yeah, I don't think I've ever wanted to go to New Mexico. Now, Apart from like, like... Getting on a plane. Actually, now, Me- now New Mexico actually sounds like really interesting. Go to Los Alamos. See the the side of the test, and then uh, Roswell. Go see yeah, some aliens, um, which, according to the U.S. <laughs> government, now exist. Yeah, um, well, yeah, well, each to their own on that one. <laughs> well, the, the U.S. government are having hearings as we speak about what they've seen and encountered, and basically have essentially said, "There's freaking aliens. We just don't have any idea where." Yeah, I'm popular. Yeah, I won't, I won't get too involved <laughs> in the politics here. But yeah, uh, Los Alamos would be sick to visit. Mm-hmm. Uh, how's the town that just popped up? Sprung up out of nowhere. Yep. So what was the budget on this project? I remember looking, and in today's 
figures. It was insane. Was it even it cost them two billion back then? I think. I think they said million, but like millions of dollars back then is billions of dollars now. No, it cost two billion back then. Jesus, it's twenty four billion today. Two billion dollars in nineteen thirty nine. Yeah, the nineteen forties, fifties. That's nuts. employed nearly one hundred and thirty thousand people. It's twenty four billion dollars today. Holy smokes! That's crazy. But the world war was on the line. So, um, yeah, like they said, they're willing to. Uh, okay. Sacrifice like thirty thousand Japanese lives for the for millions of American lives. They see and it as an investment. On that front of sacrificing America, uh, Japanese lives, uh, Harry Truman. What did you think of uh, his choice of how they chose the place to bomb? <laughs> um, because he went on a honeymoon there in Kyoto with his wife and he didn't want yep. to bomb it. <laughs> so that was the one reason they didn't bomb it. I was like, Jesus Christ, that's bad. That was, so, that was a pretty funny, like witty. I wonder how accurate that is. Uh, I know from what I've heard, this is all yeah, very well, no, close. <laughs> for those playing at home, they were like brainstorming like cities and suggestions of where they should bomb and Kyoto came up. Yeah, they, did, they didn't, oh, want, to, on, they didn't want to bomb up, Tokyo because it was like the capital and too important. And it was culturally. But then they, they looked at, yeah, Kyoto as, oh no, it's no, no, such no, no, a culturally. It's a lovely place. Culturally I went there for a honey, place, on a, my honeymoon. And I went there on a honeymoon. <laughs> okay. The That's fair. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was then, funny. Yeah. And then afterwards, yeah, Harry Truman weird. basically told Oppenheimer to toughen up Princess. Jesus, it just comes yeah. off as such a horrible human being. Yeah, piece of shit energy, eh? Lack of energy. <laughs> <laughs> and then I loved, like, like we mentioned, like so many genres, but then also so many themes as well. We had revenge and vengeance, jealousy at play as well, politics, power, control, like shadow governments where, like, uh, the Strauss character was basically running everything without sort of yeah. running anything or doing anything. Uh, then the double cross and like the scientists basically abandoning all of their morals because they wanted to achieve this like scientific breakthrough and then knowing like the, the outcomes that it would potentially have. Um, on that, what did you think spec of, of once they got, the bomb tested, everything done. Then they packed it on the back of the trucks, took it off to battle. And um, the Matt Damon general character pretty much says, thanks for your service, Oppenheimer. Uh, you'll hear from us. Pretty much like, thanks for thanks for everything you've done. You're no longer required. And pretty much We'll said, let you know how it goes. <laughs> let you know how it goes, which he found out. He was listening to the radio. Like, oh, yeah. Japan's been bombed. It was a success. That's how he finds out. Just they abuse, use him, abuse him, leave him out to dry. Yeah, no phone call. Like, thanks, guys. No, nah, yeah, just listen. Turn the radio on. You'll probably hear it on the news. Yeah. Uh, I just right now I've, got, I've received this message. This is very relevant. Uh, I don't know if I can show this on here. It'll come up. It says, "No matter how bad you want to see Oppenheimer in IMAX, do not buy a ticket in the front row." <laughs> <laughs> that would be How good is that, that would be disturbing, yes. <laughs> That's a very big Cillian oh Murphy my face. Oh god. That's so good. I love that. Uh anyway, what is that? Is that we've covered it all? What are we um we were gonna do a little something something at the end of this, weren't we? Uh yeah. The only other things I had as a note were the some of the makeup to like age the actors. Oh, bro, I was going to say that at the end. That No, that scene at the end where Oppenheim is collecting his medal mm -hmm. and everyone is aged. It's like they use that iPhone instant face aging app. Yep. What did you think of some of those? So, I thought some of them looked great. Like, I think Cillian looked really Emily good. Emily Blunt was brilliant. Emily yeah, Blunt Cillian looked great. Was, uh, and Safdie didn't really change much. Some of, them looked, hair. some of them looked a bit average, but yeah, mixed outcomes. Uh, but I think the main ones that, that was we weird. I don't think they... Did they need to do that? Did that scene need to happen? 
I guess so that like we all understand that he did that. eventually get the recognition I'm he deserved. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, the other note I had was with a Nolan movie, you kind of expect that crazy twist. And yeah. for so long, this movie didn't feel like a Nolan movie. Like I couldn't see where the twist was coming. And then when it hit with the uh, Strauss was the one behind all of the the crap happening to Oppenheimer. I was like, oh, there's the twist. Oh, snitches, eh? Snitches get stitches. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I, I, actually on that, I reckon you know, we could sit a lot of people down in front of this movie, tell them nothing about it, and I reckon 8 out of 10 wouldn't be able to tell you this is a Christopher Nolan film. No. Because, yeah, it doesn't have, uh, like, crazy twists and stuff. It's just... And then there's just this one big one. You're like, oh, okay. That yeah. changes the whole, like complexion of the rest of the movie. And even like visually, like, like, yeah, we knew it was an old film. So we're like, oh yeah, this is sick. And like, we could, we could tell, but it wasn't blockbuster, massive action packed as others. And there actually was, it wasn't like as many big scenes and constant action as other Nolan films, was it? No, it's, it's very much more of a, a drama movie. Uh, and then, so in terms of, uh, the box office cost them a hundred million dollars, but so far globally in the opening weekend, they have made $174 million, making it Nolan's biggest non Batman movie. Mm. It's, it's the third biggest biopic to ever open in the U S and it's the biggest R rated opening since Joker in 2019. I didn't think of it as a biopic. <laughs> it is. Just you're not your usual biopic, not your typical. <laughs> yep. And yet it's, his, it's Nolan's first film since Insomnia <clears throat> in 2002 to not feature Michael Caine, which was shocking. He's been, Huge. He's been in every Nolan film since Batman Begins in 2005. That's yep. massive. And... He wasn't seen in Dunkirk, but he had a voiceover as the commander that speaks via the radio. He's like in his, he's like in his 90s now anyway, isn't he? Yeah. Uh, and then there was one <clears throat> glaring error in the, the, the scene we spoke about where uh, Oppenheimer is giving his speech afterwards and has like the, the moment with himself. Uh, the flags yep. that are being waved mm. have 50 stars on them. Oh, and it's not but correct to the that time. That fifty star flag wasn't introduced until nineteen fifty nine, <laughs> and the bombing occurred in nineteen forty five. What a doozy! So the flag should have so yeah. the flag should have only had forty eight <laughs> stars. Hey, that's a good one. So that's, that's a good one. I'm like hey. Nolan is normally a, a stickler for that stuff, so I'm shocked that yeah, that, that's that snuck by. Someone well, on the production team more. is getting fired. I wonder if there's more to it. Well, I haven't heard about that one yet, so maybe it's I assume like it was probably just someone in like set and prop didn't think. Yeah. They were just like, I hey, have 50 stars, US flag. They just went, oh, we need US flags and just grabbed US flags and didn't go, wait, is this the accurate flag for the time? Maybe, like can- maybe like a Canadian or someone was in charge of all that sort of stuff. Just didn't know any better. Probably some random intern that was like, hey, we need this. This many flags, and he just went and bought them from the party store. Couple off Amazon. Yeah, we just go. Yeah, see what's in the prop store department. Uh, so, before we close Sorry. out our episode, thought we should rank our favorite Nolan movies. I have a list of seven. <laughs> what was? What would you rank as your top three or four? Um, there's a lot of Nolan films I've only seen once because they're, they're sort of that sort of films. Like, but um, <clears throat> this isn't going to be like a groundbreaking list, but third, I'm probably going to put Dunkirk. And these next two I've seen so many times and they're some of my favourite movies, period. Um, the Dark Knight and The Dark Knight Rises is number one. I am obsessed with The Dark Knight Rises. There's a film period. It is an absolute epic. Mm -hmm. That's 
that's just, that's all I got to say. Um, honorable mentions, obviously, to Interstellar, um, Inception. Yeah, but uh, Dark Knight Rises is just the pinnacle for me. Of I'm not an action film guy, notoriously. I don't. I'm not into your. I don't know. Yeah, Mission Impossible is your John Wicks. I don't know the list goes that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not into superhero movies. Everyone says that. Um, ask me about it and I'll say like, yeah, I'm not into superhero movies, but I love Batman and Christopher Nolan has made me fall in love with Batman. He yeah. has portrayed Batman Have so you seen the well. new Batman? Uh, Robert Pattinson. The Pattinson Batman? Yeah, yeah I haven't. It's great. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, and I had mixed feelings going into it because it wasn't going to be Christopher Nolan, but it was great for what it is. But Batman to me is Christopher Nolan. So the Dark Knight Rises, it's just brilliant. Um, I'm, 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 filled, with hot, I'm because, filled with hot takes right now. Um, yeah, I've, yeah, I don't know. Tenant, I've still only seen it once when I was in the cinema and I'm still trying to unpack it and I'm not quite sure what happened. Yep. I need to watch it again. Yep. Right, so I'm going to have some controversial hot takes here that might piss you there off you right now. Here we go. First and foremost... The Batman is better than both Nolan Batman movies. Yeah, that's fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that would get you. What the hell? And then, I wouldn't say it's better. It's a brilliant film, don't get me wrong, but you can't compare the two. Uh, I think it's a better depiction of the oh original my. idea of what Batman is. Oh, my God. Like I said, I'm not a comic book guy, and I don't really care, like, how Batman was depicted, but Chris <laughs> Nolan does a good Batman. No, he, does, he does a great Batman, but I think <laughs> Matt Reeves topped him. Well, I'm not like, I'm not a comic book purist. So I don't care how he's portrayed, but I like how Chris Nolan portrayed him. Fair enough. So then in terms of my <laughs> Nolan movie rankings. Here we go. Give me, hit me. Oppenheimer is at the top. <clears throat> I absolutely adore this movie, and Huge. I want to see it in cinemas probably two or three more times. Like, it's freaking fantastic. So Oppenheimer, number two, The Dark Knight. Number three, Inception. Number four, Interstellar. Five, The Dark Knight Rises. Six, Tenet. And seven, The Prestige. I was not a fan of Dunkirk. I enjoyed it for what it was, but it's not one that I'm desperate to go back and rewatch. Kid doesn't like Harry Styles, I'm taking it. Harry was fine. Um, no, all right. The biggest thing I want to pull apart from that, uh, why do you have the Dark Knight so much higher than the Dark Knight Rises and why do you have the Dark Knight so high, period? Heath Ledger Heath. or the bank robbery scene? Yeah, Heath. I think it just has a better hero-villain dynamic than... All right, what's your favourite scene from that movie? The, probably the bank robbery. Or when the joke is like, Watch me make this pencil disappear. Yeah. And he goes, yeah. That's sick. Yeah, that, that scene actually is so sick when they're upstairs in that little meeting room. Yep. And the joke comes in, he's got like his vest with like the grenade and bomb and shit. That's sick. That's a sick yeah. thing. I just think like the Joker, uh, the Joker is a much more iconic character than Bane to begin with. But then, yeah, the, oh, yeah, the interplay 100%. between Batman and the Joker, I think, is stronger than the interplay between Bane and the Joker. Uh, Bane and Batman. Yeah. Um, you know, I just thought of something. Why hasn't Tom, Tom Hardy got a role in Oppenheimer? Surely they could have fit him in. Every every friggin' other MF is in it. Why hasn't Tom Hardy? Yeah, Tom Hardy's a, normally in Nolan movies, so it's a bit surprising. Do you reckon um, actors take, like, less of a salary to feature in a Nolan film? Because I can yes. just imagine how much it would have cost people to be tough. They, has, they have to have with the budget for this movie. Because like, the fact that the budget come in $100 million and they got the NBA All-Star game of actors in this, I th- like, what? I think Nolan is now <clears throat> probably on the sort of... Prestige, privilege list. The, the, like, the Spielberg and the Scorsese sort of level where... Tarantino. Yeah, where they literally just go, I'm making a movie. I want you in it for this role. I'll and people go, yeah, cool. I'll... Eight times less to be in it. Yeah, people like, just go... I want it. It's... Oh, okay. it's, it's resume stuff for people. It's like Star Wars too, where big name actors will just be like, can I just be a stormtrooper just so I can be in a Star Wars movie? Yeah, yeah, that's so, sick. Yeah. 
I think yeah, I've definitely got Nolan is on that fun. level now where he just rings someone and goes, do you want to be in this movie? And they go, yeah, whatever, just I'll be in it. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll work it out. Like, yeah. I think, I like, who was it? Too. Leo or someone was in one of his movies and just said, yeah, I'll just take a, a percentage rather than... What, Inception? Yeah. I think, I'm pretty sure Leo said... Uh, I think so. I'm pretty sure it was, yeah, Inception where he said, I don't want to, like, don't pay me, just give me a percentage. And yeah, it's... If the movie is a success, which Nolan is on that level now where it pretty much is guaranteed to be a success, taking a percentage will end up getting you more money than taking... Yeah, like I said, it's like, even not like even for the like the small actors like a Ben Safdie or a Josh Peck, like the fact that they've now been in a Nolan film and that's on their resume, like yeah. they're going to pick up it so much more work. Put you in so another level. Work. And like then for guys like Matt Damon and who else we said was in it's Gary Oldman, it's just Robert Downey Jr. It just cements them as the greats. Yeah, uh, and they're like, they're like bookmarks their career. Then before we give our rankings, this also made me want to go and read the book that the movie is adapted from, American Prometheus: The Triumph and Tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer by Kai Bird. That'd be such a tough read. I reckon like, it would be a lot, lots of process. Yes, yeah, sir. So. For, to have such a good movie come out of it and still want to read the book, I think that says a lot. Oh, uh, yeah. There's a few movies that make me feel like that, but it's not because it's normally the other way around. You're, you'll read a like, book and like, shit, I can't wait to see how other people view that and how it's actually visually portrayed. Mm -hmm. uh, there have only been a very small amount of movies that I've watched. I'm like, I need to go back and read the original novel. Yep. And not the uh, movie novel, because yep. a lot of movies have a novel. A novelization. You want the... And yeah, you want the actual novel that the movie was based on. Yep. So in terms of rating, what would you give Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer? Um, yeah. <clears throat> Regretting giving out that five last week now? No, I'm not at all. <laughs> but it, it, the, the five for Barbie does come into play here. Um, I don't know. I And I, I think I've settled on a rating. It would be it would be a five if the explosion for the test bombing was bigger and better that is what's stopping it from being a five for me but i don't know i just feel like it's very close to a five I and mean, if that's the only petty thing i'm going to pull apart from this film it's too good for a four and a half I'm going to give this 4.8 facefuls of zinc out of 5. Fair enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For me, this was a 5. This is a must-see, get there and watch it as soon as you can. On the biggest possible yeah, screen no you can. No, don't, uh, don't go to the... Oh, Max, don't sit in the front row. <laughs> and yeah, don't go to the gala in Boralong. Like, go to the... Hey, take nothing scene. away from the gala, Jamie. The gala's fine, but, but not for this movie. But don't see a Nolan film. No. You need to see this. If you're listening, gala, give us free tickets, bro. You need to see this on the biggest possible screen you can find. I treated myself to a little bit of gold class, actually. Had a table service, some arancini balls, pepperoni pizza. I had arancini coffee, balls, too. popcorn. Did you? At, you did, too. At the preview, they had yeah. arancini and chocolate brownies. It was great. I and ate way too many. Slapped. I had like eight of them, and I was like, keep these MFs coming. Yeah, they were delicious. Um, yeah, I'm a little disappointed IMAX in Sydney hasn't opened yet. Yeah, we're actually talking about this. It's going to be freaking ages. Isn't it? It's it's at the W Hotel. Yeah, hey? like it's still the they same said building. It, Apparently, they, they said it could be any time this year. So <sighs> yeah, believe it or not, so there's one in Melbourne though. If you're that keen, Ooh, I am potentially going to Melbourne next month. There you go. Yeah, you know, we'll be still there in the month. So if I do, I will, it'll still be. I think this will be a there movie that. No matter what else is out at the time that IMAX Sydney opens, they will run this movie. <laughs> yeah, I'm here now. Um, it's going to be out forever. And like we just said with the strikes, like nothing new is coming out anytime soon. Like, well, it's going to slow down a lot. Yep. Alrighty, so that's Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer. Thank you, everyone, for listening to the commentary booth.
If you enjoyed the show, please remember to rate, review and subscribe on podcast services and on YouTube. You can follow me on social media at Jamie Ups Media and at Parry Magazine. And you can follow Blake on Twitter at Captain Crumbs with a Z. The Commentary Booth is a fan-funded production of Jamie Ups Media. You can support the podcast alongside our magazine, Pario Magazine, on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash jamieappsmedia. The following people supported at the publisher level or higher, and you cannot fathom how incredibly appreciative we are for their support. <laughs>